Let's get this sports podcast party started, all right? The J Reels Podcast. What is happening, Michael people? Greetings. How are you? How's it going? How's everybody doing out there? What is the latest and greatest? Hope everybody's doing well, feeling fantastic, in excellent spirits. Still in the muck of this sports dead zone, but that will keep me on my toes as I conclude the week with another podcast. As this is the J Reels Podcast with your host, J Reels. For my first time, as welcome aboard. And for those who've been banging with me going back to the very beginning, somewhere in the middle, or even as early as this past Monday, I welcome you guys and gals back. And a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. For those who are interested in vlogs, those are video logs detailing whether it be just a day in the life, week in the life, or in this case, a trip in the life of yours truly. Well, part one was released on Sunday, where I discussed that on Monday's podcast. My escape to Florida, that was Orlando and Kissimmee. But this time around, which was just released a short time ago, Escape to Florida, part two, Miami. And yes, there is some sports involved. As I go to Mets Marlins there, the final game of that four-game series, which was actually a month ago today, to open up the quote-unquote second half of the baseball season. So you'll get a taste of that, as well as reacquainting myself to South Beach, as I haven't been to Florida up until last week, or really South Florida, for over six years. So I'll take a trip down memory lane, going up and down the streets of South Beach, as well as reuniting with my brother, going into Wynwood, as well as just a podcast day in the life, as my final full day there was about that, and some agenda and some issues that had popped up. So I have another, and I get it, it's a little bit over an hour. So people saying, Jay Reels, that's not a vlog, that's a movie. I get it. I wanted to and had thought about some bite-sized samples of just a day of each of those final few days in Florida, but I just decided to make it one long video. But at the same time, it's on the YouTube channel, at J Reels, if you could peep it. Subscribe, like, leave a comment. Believe you me, I would sincerely and gratefully appreciate it. So that is item number one. And item number two, of course, Olipop. Summer is still in full bloom, and yes, it doesn't feel like that in these parts, especially in the Northeast. Felt more like October, late October for that matter, but we still have another month to go officially. So for those who are looking to quench their thirst, for those who are looking to even beat the heat no matter where you're at, go to drinkolipop.com, O-L-I-P-O-P. Save 15% off of your order by using the promo code JREELS at checkout. I get a kickback of that, so buy a case, buy a couple, buy them for your family, friends, foes, frenemies, buy a dozen. Why not? You're helping out your boy in the process, so if you could do that one more time, I'd be super thankful if you go to drinkolipop.com and a bunch of flavors there. So for the guys or gals that like cola, lemon lime, ginger ale, root beer, they have those as well as watermelon lime, banana cream, what? Peaches and cream? Yes, that too. Even cherry cola, so please go there and tell them J Real sent you. Now as we move it along here, and yes, this is a podcast that I know on days where it's slow, or in this case, a week that's slow, and yes, we're just trying to get to the football season in the NFL. Two weeks from tonight, the NFL season will begin, as well as college football, which I'll get to a little bit later on. That's actually officially going to begin on Saturday, but as we try to move it along this baseball season, and you know that's where I'm going to begin. And if you're watching on YouTube, yes, I broke out the blue and orange. And this is a rarity because I just very seldom, I believe when the Celtics won the final, I probably wore the Celtic t-shirt. But I'm showing solidarity to my fellow Met fans that despite the fact this upcoming 10-day trip, which the back three are in Chicago against the White Sox, and hopefully they're not looking past their next two opponents, which are four in San Diego and three in Arizona. But this is where I'm going to start, people, because I want to put out some good juju there. I want to be able to kind of wash off whatever cynicism, whatever just jaded perspective that I have of this Met team, and the reason why I'm dressed in the Met garb, and including the baseball cap, is because I want to have a good feeling. I want to be able to exhale with just positivity. And for all that's out there that are looking at this 10-game road trip, I have to be honest, this is going to define the Mets season. And we can look at September's schedule, and I know it'll lighten up a little bit. We still have to go to Atlanta, which could be enormous when it's all said and done. 
and we still have a series with the Phillies, which is going to be big. And there's a couple of others along the way. But all we can look at is tonight in Arizona, as well as after these four days, to have to go to the desert to play the Diamondbacks, two teams that are ahead of the Mets in the wild card race. And not to say we're going to catch them, because right now, when we look at the standings, they have a sizable lead over the Mets. We have to worry about Atlanta, who after yesterday's win and beating the Orioles two out of three, which was enormous. And I talked about that on the channel yesterday, if you watched on YouTube, because I thought that was a must-win game for the Mets. They needed to leave Dodge to at least feel good about themselves flying to the West Coast as opposed to, let's say, losing a crushing game or even getting blown out to have that sit with them on a cross-country flight to embark on one more time. This is it for this Met team. And I get it that they have the White Sox at the tail end, that even if they go, let's say, ugh, I hope they don't go 2-5, and five, but they could actually come home with a winning record or they'll actually be an even record, I should say. Let me do my math properly here as I try to gather my thoughts. They could still come home 5-5 five and five on a 500 trip and maybe no harm, no foul. But uh-uh, you can't fool around if you're the Mets. And if they could somehow, some way, and I know this may be a little bit greedy, but hey, I'm going to go for it. Again, positive vibes, good karma, etc. If they could split these next four games in San Diego, as well as win two out of three in Arizona, and come to Chicago with a day off in between, leaving Phoenix to go to the Windy City, they'll be able to at least minimum, you would think, have a 6-4 and four road trip, or dare I even say 7-4 and four if they do sweep the lowly White Sox, who will already have 100 losses on their ledger by the time the Mets get to the Midwest. And the only thing I'm going to say here is that if they could get to that point that a week from today where we could assess these seven games, or really the three games in Arizona, and we could take a look at the baseball landscape, especially the National League wild card, to see where this Met team is at. If they could be four and three a week from today, I will say hallelujah. Does that automatically mean that they're going to get the final wild card or maybe even get that much closer to San Diego and Arizona to upstage them and get a four or five seed? Absolutely not. But I'm sure the Mets fans are going to feel a lot better about themselves if they somehow do a, not the impossible, but a four and three record. Is that a lot to ask for? I don't think it is. Despite the fact that San Diego and Arizona have played well here over the last six to seven weeks. And it's not asking much. Now, I get it. Two out of three in Arizona after splitting four games, that may be a little dicey. And the Mets have not really fared well in San Diego over the years. So that's asking a lot. Now, you have Luis Severino, who's going to start, and hopefully he can piggyback off of his last start against the Marlins. Obviously, he was at home and against a AAA lineup. And now he's going up against a playoff contending team where they've been playing well and certainly clicking on all cylinders. But hopefully Severino, as well as... The other guys on the staff named David Peterson and Jose Quintana, who was not good the other night. But let's see what they can do. And hopefully the bats will continue to perform and wake up as they had some heroic performances, especially in this last series where they got two walk-off homers in the ninth inning. Francisco Alvarez pointing at home plate for about 20 minutes. All right. And I love Alvarez. So I don't want to hear that. Oh, here we go. Jay Reels, get off my lawn. The old man theory. I've actually been open to the home run celebration or pimping the home run. I don't like Cadillacing around the bases for a half hour. That I could do away with. But if you're going to do the bat flip, if you're going to stare at the home run, or if you're going to point at the dugout, or if you're going to raise your arms or whatever, all right, I've come to maybe not know and love, but know and accept that this is baseball in 2024. So for Alvarez to do that, and then Jesse Winker, a guy that, of course, the Met fan couldn't stand over the years, and obviously we're going to have to root for him because he's one of our own. And yesterday, looking like Bryce Harper there, hitting that home run in the bottom of the ninth to seal not only the series, but a Met victory to head out to Southern California for him to slam his helmet and just his hair flying all over the place. And just, I couldn't believe it. I'm saying to myself, what the hell is going on here? It was almost as if when you see the wide receiver get a first down and he has all the histrionics and the gyrations and the first down gesture, etc. It's similar to that. 
But as I digress and talk about this Met team, all I can hope for, and I'm sure all the Met fans out there, whether your name is John Guerrero, whether your name is Scott Seaman, whether your name is Jerome DeSantis, whether your name is Mark Vega, I know that you are hoping that you could get to Chicago with a 4-3 record. If it's 3-4, and four, you'd have to live with it. 2-5, and five, that'd be completely unacceptable. Because that means you either lost 3 out of 4 in San Diego and then lost 2 out of 3 in Arizona. Or any combination of 2-2 two and two in San Diego getting swept in Arizona. You could come up with all the permutations as many times as you want. 3-4, and four, I'll have to take it. But 4-3 and three is what I want. That is not asking for the sun, moon, stars, or galaxy for a Met fan to think that, all right, and watch them get to Chicago 4-3 and three and they'll lose 2 out of 3. Could you imagine? That'd be typical Mets, though. Or better yet, could you imagine they win 3 out of 4 in San Diego, 2 out of 3 in Arizona, and then next thing you know, they go to Chicago, you're thinking, oh my goodness, wait a minute, we may have hit the jackpot here, and then they'll lose 2 out of 3 against the just dreaded and awful Chicago White Sox. But again, I know, as you're watching on YouTube, I'm trying to wipe the cynicism and just the negative energy. No, let's think positive here. And when we reconnect on Monday, let's see how these four games in San Diego unfold. To me, that's a story I look at in baseball. And yes, I can go through the divisions and everything that I broke down there on Monday, but I'm not going to do that because there hasn't been a lot of turnover, a lot of changes. Yes, you had the Red Sox win two out of three in Houston, which keeps their playoff chase and the wild card alive. And they have been alive, but even more so because Houston, as we know, has been playing well. Seattle, what more can you say? But to me, I thought a lot of this coming into the weekend, and we'll break the schedule down in a moment. I think that the Met road trip, and I get it, they're on the outside looking in and people say, well, Jay Reels, they're not even part of the top six teams in the NL. How can they be a theme? Well, not only me being a Met fan, but even more so because they're going back out west for the second time this month. Because if you forgot, prior to this long homestand of nine games, which they went five and four, they had a, another 10-game road trip, which one was a makeup game in St. Louis, if you recall, but they had to go to Anaheim for three, which they lost two out of three. They won the game in St. Louis, won two out of three in Colorado before getting swept in Seattle. So now they got to go back on a flight, which is already there now, but from there, and then they have to go to Arizona, which is, of course, coming east, but you're still pretty much in the western time zone. I mean, pretty much central. Well, it's still, it's not as if you're down the street and around the corner, and then you get to the Midwest to play Chicago before coming home. Brutal road trip. I mean, think about it. 20 of these next 29 games, and they already got 19 in the books, are on the road and predominantly on the west coast. So that, to me, is the big story in baseball, at least from my perspective, that I see. And yes, we could talk about series, we could talk about what's gone on here, but I'm looking ahead, trying to look into the crystal ball and trying to just bring out the coconuts, palm trees, the sunshine, the ocean for the Met fan. And yes, if we get to Monday and the outlook is pretty much the same, great. If they lose three out of four, then it's going to be storms, there's going to be who knows what, and We'll get to break it down at that time. But that's where I'm going to start. And now as I move on to other things here, the week that we've seen so far in baseball, now there's a couple of themes here when it comes to injuries, which I'll get to later on. I know Justin Verlander returned here. Yeah, speaking of that Red Sox Astro series where the Sox did win two out of three, Justin Verlander came back, five innings, six strikeouts, two runs, four hits. All right, now Verlander, he's probably not going to go more than six innings unless his pitch limit is low, and you know they're going to slowly but surely bring him in as we get into September and get themselves ready for what they would hope, another deep October run. But he was the big news coming back, and you had a lot of guys that were going out. Whether your name was Austin Riley, six to eight weeks, that could be the rest of the regular season for him. In fact, it probably will, considering we're now roughly five and a half weeks from now until the final Sunday of September. And then they bring in Gio Urshela, which was a very good pickup for them. Urshela, decent stick, obviously plays a gold glove third base, so they probably won't miss a beat considering Austin Riley, his numbers have been way down this year as far as his power numbers go. So they bring in Urshela to take his place, so that was a big move there. Zach Eflin, who the 
Baltimore Orioles got, and you figured that he was going to be a big part of this rotation from here on out. Now he's on the I.L. with a shoulder issue, so who knows how long he's going to be out, whether it's just shoulder fatigue, he's going to miss three starts, does he come back there in the middle of September, or are they going to maybe put him on ice until the final 10 days where he could get a couple of starts before going into October? That we'll have to wait and see. Speaking of pitchers going on the I.L., the Yankees, Luis Heal, who has been up and down here, especially over the last month or so. It's had good starts, but certainly not as torrid as he was at the start of the year. But with a back strain, who knows how backs are going to behave. We get it from one day to the next. He could be riding high, feeling good, but all he has to do is just throw one pitch and then it goes right out. So that would be a big loss for the Yankees, considering he's a good arm, a guy that obviously has been steady throughout the course of the year, but not as spectacular as he was, like I mentioned, over the first two months. And as far as a guy that's looking to come back, and the Dodgers would walk him with open arms, considering Tyler Glass now, considering River Ryan, in and out of the lineup for a guy like Walker Bueller, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, Eyeing a September return, who knows when in September, but I would think they're going to proceed with caution until he's 100% sound, considering the investment that they have, the 13 years for $325 million, but they've got to get him back soon, even though they do have a four-game lead over both the Diamondbacks and Padres, but for Yamamoto, we would think that once he returns, that's going to be a big boon for that rotation, considering it's been tattered and torn pretty much from the start of the year. But Yamamoto, who had a simulated game, only two innings, but again, they're going to ramp that up here over the next couple of weeks. I'm sure his next simulated start will be three innings, and they will get him to five, and I'm sure once they get him to the major league level, he'll probably have a pitch limit, 75, 80 pitches, which would be roughly, if you do the math, 15, 16 pitches per inning, five innings, and then ramp him up from there, and then hope once he gets to October, he'll be primed and ready to go. So those are the news and notes there. But other than that, there hasn't been a lot gone on. I know Red Sox Astros, that was one series I talked about. Yankees and Guardians will end their series. As a matter of fact, they're playing now as I had to push up this recording. Instead of early in the morning, I'm actually doing it mid-afternoon. As I look at the time, it is 1.22 p.m. So first inning is probably in the books, or at least maybe Yankees are, bottom, are batting in the bottom of the first but let's see where the Guardians, if they could take two out of three from the Yankees, and the Yankees now have first place considering what the Orioles did against the Mets. So as the Orioles, and they have a big series, which I'll get to in a moment, but the Yankees trying to get this win, and this will be big for them because they have the Rockies coming in, and I'm sure they're going to beat up on Colorado over the weekend. So maybe they could get some distance between them and the Orioles because the Astros will be coming through the Northeast Corridor. They'll play four games starting tonight in Baltimore before going up the corridor to play the Phillies in a rematch of the 2022 World Series. So Astros will be not necessarily in this neck of the woods, but not too far down I-95. So if the Yankees were able to get this win today, they will continue their lead and it'll be a game ahead because tonight is Astros and Orioles. So even if the Yankees win, they'll still be in first place no matter what the Orioles do, whether they win or lose tonight. If they win, they'll still be a half game back, but you get the picture there as far as what's happening in the AL East. But other than that, the other series of note over the week, Philly and Atlanta, they split the first two games there. Philly winning last night. They'll have their rubber match there tonight before Philly comes back. And obviously they'll play the, over the weekend, they're not going to play the Astros. That's for next week, Jay Reels. I got ahead of myself there. I'll look at the weekend in a second, but other than that, I'm not going to get into a lot of the other series that have taken place here. There wasn't anything that was too big here over the last three or four days as I pull up the schedule. Arizona concludes their series in Miami. Big whoop. Minnesota, San Diego. I understand that that was for two teams in the wild card. But again, that isn't anything that I'm going to get crazy about or when it's all said and done, just look at from a standpoint of, oh, you know, those two teams could possibly be in a World Series against one another. No, they actually salvaged that series yesterday. The Twins that was in San Diego. So, again, nothing really to get too wrapped up in. And other than that, I know Milwaukee, St. Louis, Arenado had a big grand slam, a walk off in the 10th inning, but they're a million games behind the Brewers and far out of the NL wildcard chase. So, that's what you have there with the games that had taken place this week. And then, oh, yes, you want to talk about the Mariners who are in 
LA over the week, and what happened? They got swept out of LA in a typical Mariner fashion as they were just unable to produce enough runs to get themselves at least one win over their three-day stay in LA, and they will move on, I believe, on the road again as I take a look at the schedule this weekend. Your four gamers this week, we talked about Houston, Baltimore. That's the only four-game series besides them and Met San Diego. That are of note. I'm not going to get into Pirates, Reds, or any other series that's going to crop up here. No, those are the only other series that's going to have a four-game series over the course of this weekend. But as we look for tomorrow, Arizona and Boston, very interesting series there. One to keep an eye on. As far as those two, those two teams, I get it. It's AL versus NL, but we know Arizona and Boston, hot pursuit in the wild card chase. Maybe the division for Arizona four games back, but ah, we think LA is going to win it when it's all said and done. St. Louis, Minnesota. Yeah, you really do not have a very intriguing weekend when it comes to baseball. Yes, Houston, Baltimore, big series as we know. And yes, we could talk about Arizona, Boston. That's more maybe like a four-star, three-and-a-half-star matchup. Other than that, if I go through this list, I'm going to put you to sleep. Texas at Cleveland, as we know, the Rangers are done. Washington and Atlanta, that's big because of the National League wild card, which I'll get to in a second. Philly at Kansas City, all right, you got a 1980 World Series rematch. Of course, that's what, 44 years ago. But Philly, KC, KC playing well, I understand, may not be among the Houston and Baltimore because it is ALNL, but that's one that... I'm sure it's a good barometer for KC as the Phillies come to town. Then you have San Francisco at Seattle, only because Seattle trying to hang in there in the AL West. Tampa at LA to play the Dodgers. All right, so you got that. But besides Detroit and Chicago, the White Sox, ugh. Cubs in Miami, ugh. Colorado, New York, as I mentioned. Yes, other than that, a very lackluster slate. St. Louis, Minnesota, Milwaukee's at Oakland. Ugh, that's what you have there for the weekend. And then for the standings, just to recap, we know about the division in the AL East as well as the AL Central. By the hairs of the by the hairs of their chinny chin chin, if I could speak properly, Yankees have that half game lead as we discussed. Guardians with a two and a half game lead over both the Twins and Royals as of right this moment. So keep that in mind. That's a big game there for the Guardians to win, that I think. Not only for the big picture, but just to get out of the Bronx with a series win, which could maybe raise some eyebrows and maybe the slightest of doubt in the Yankees. I don't think so, because come October, I think the Yankees will slaughter them, despite the fact that the Guardians did take the Yankees to a five-game series just two years ago. But the Twins and Royals hanging in there in the Central. Astros, Mariners, they have a six-game lead, the Astros, in the loss, five games behind overall. I think the Astros are going to be home free. Phillies, if they win today, they will have gained the game in the standings. They're going to win a division. They have seven up, but if the Braves win, they'll gain a game over the series. So we'll keep an eye on that. Then you have the Diamondbacks, Padres, again, four back behind the Dodgers. The Cardinals, as we know, they're a sinking ship in the central and pretty much in the entire playoff picture and now as we talk about the wild card right now you have the Orioles in the wild card lead because of their loss yesterday and the Yankees winning let's see if that could change today if the Yankees lose and the Orioles win but Orioles with the four seed twins two games as well as the Royals because they're both tied with the same record 71 and 56 they are with the tiebreaker the twins have the five Royals six and then you have the Red Sox, who are three in a loss, three and a half back, even with them winning two out of three in Houston. And then you have the Rays, who are now six in a loss, six and a half back. And it is precipitously a drop. So right now, you're looking at the Red Sox, not necessarily hanging on for dear life, but Arizona coming in, that's going to be a huge series for the Red Sox. With a day off today, maybe they can regroup, win two out of three, and inch closer in that wild card. But that's what you have there. And then... Arizona-San Diego tied there. They are four games ahead of the Atlanta Braves. Three and a loss, though, when it comes to the wild card standings in the NL. Then you have the Mets, two games and a loss, a game and a half back behind the Braves. The Giants, three and a half back behind the Braves. And then you have the big drop-off from there. Five, five and a half for Cincinnati, excuse me, for St. Louis, 
Cincinnati and Chicago, but I'm not even going to include those teams right now. Uh, give the Giants their due only because they are, think about it, they're actually five in the loss with three and a half back, but who has the advantage? Uh, 67-59. Actually, the Braves have three games at hand, so that is a disadvantage to the Giants. So even though they're three and a half back, but they're five in a loss, that certainly doesn't bode well for them. And like I mentioned on Monday's podcast, it's a scenario where can we have a September that could be an empty cupboard once you get to, let's say, September 15th? Because the wild card picture in the AL is right now looking like it's going to be out to sea before you know it with the Red Sox being the only team. And yes, I get it that you're going to have Twins and Royals battle it out to see who faces the four seed. And then with the Braves, Mets, and maybe the Giants... Who knows? We talked about this Met road trip, how big it is. So we could get to September 15th and maybe have a couple of division races with the AL East and the AL Central, quite possibly the NL West. And that may be it when it comes to any drama or intrigue as we get to the stretch of this baseball season. And then lastly, you had a retirement in a one Joey Votto, the longtime Red who signed a minor league contract with the Toronto Blue Jays and was not brought up to the big leagues. Maybe he had a cup of coffee earlier this year, but I don't think that's the case. But for Votto, 40 years of age, in my eyes, he's not a Hall of Famer. He's borderline. I get it. He has the numbers. He has the metrics. He has what you, which every analytic loves as far as the on-base and the walks. And does have power numbers. He did win an MVP. What was that? early 2000s, and was runner-up a couple of times. I believe one time, Giancarlo Stanton in 2017, when he won it with the Marlins. And I think it was another time where Votto... Let me pull him up real quick. But Votto, who had a very good career. Good first baseman. Lifelong Red. Certainly going to go into the Ring of Honor there, the Red Hall of Fame. When it's all said and done, and I'm sure he's going to have his number retired. But as far as him being a lock first ballot, uh uh-uh, not this guy. And yes, they win an MVP. Let's see what year. That's what I need to determine. Six-time All-Star. It was 2010. I knew it was in the 20 teens, going way back that far. But for Votto, excellent career. What more can you say about what he meant to the city of Cincinnati? And as I look, let's see. He had a long layoff ankle injury, played at AAA, went 6-42. Yes, so I don't believe he was brought up. 294 lifetime average, 356 homers, 1144 RBIs, 409 on base, which is big because how many guys get a 409 on base? I wonder what his slugging is. I'm sure his slugging was good based on his on base. And led NL in on base seven times. A lot of that, again, with walks people. So black type is big. I think when it's all said and done, he's probably going to be a Hall of Famer. But yeah. I don't know. To me, it's borderline. You know I'm a hard marker when it comes to the Hall of Fame. So let me close the book on baseball and move it along here as I put on my helmet and shoulder pads to discuss what's happening in the NFL as we're now approaching the final set of preseason games. And I could care less. I know there's been a lot of talk about who should be playing this week, who's not playing. We know Aaron Rodgers. I know there's been a discussion there about this has been the hardest camp he's had in about seven, eight years, but he's not even going to play in the game, and I understand that it's not about playing in the games. I would have liked to see him play at least one series just to get his feet wet. Now, we get it that he's been around the block a million times, and of course, they don't want to get him hurt, but that's just me. I think Rodgers under center for at least one series would have been good just to get at least the feeling in his veins, just to get the adrenaline running as opposed to waiting to get to San Francisco or Santa Clara to face that defense Monday night. And we saw what happened a year ago on Monday night. Not wishing him the same as a knock on wood. But I thought it would have been good. Maybe that was a decision that was made between both the quarterback and the head coach, or maybe even the front office for that matter. But I'll just leave it right there. But the other news when it comes to especially the rookie quarterbacks, and we already have a couple that have been anointed and officially starters on the Washington Commanders and the Denver Broncos. That being Jaden Daniels, who has shown some flashes in the short amount of time that he's played here throughout the course of this preseason. So no shock there. Top pick, number two overall, gets to be the starter when the Commanders will open up their season 
two weeks from this coming Sunday, and then you have Bo Nix, the Oregon quarterback, by way of Auburn, he will be under center for a one Sean Payton when they begin their season. And I believe their first two games on the road, if I'm not mistaken. So, hostile territory, I believe they're going to, off the top of my head, I think it's the Chargers and the Chiefs back-to-back weeks. So, that's going to be an interesting test for the rookie there, Bo Nix. And kudos to both of them to get the nod and hopefully will be the face of the franchise for many years to come. But then you have questions about the two other organizations that were the teams that drafted their quarterbacks, number one and number three. That being Caleb Williams, who has been passing his preseason test with flying colors, but has not been officially announced by the head coach, Matt Eberflus. What are they waiting for? I don't know, but maybe they want to keep the suspense. They have hard knocks in their building, HBO, so maybe they want to draw it out until they get to the final episode. Who knows? So that could be the theory there in Chicago as far as not penciling in Caleb Williams as a starting quarterback for the Bears. And then you have Drake May in New England, which as we all know, I understand Belichick has long left the building, but with Gerard Mayo being an understudy and trying to get that blueprint of keeping everything tight-lipped, everything close to the vest, not announcing or trying to tip his hand too early, I don't know what's going on there as far as the progress of Drake May. I don't know if he's actually performed as well as Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix, or even Caleb Williams. I guess that's going to be probably a, maybe not a game time decision, but I'm sure the week leading into their first game of the season, you're probably not going to know if Drake May is going to be your guy under center for week one. So that will have to wait and see. And... Speaking of former Patriot coaches, I got to bring this up, and I'm only going to bring this up for literally two minutes. I know you had Tua Tagovailoa and Brian Flores, the former coach of the Dolphins, who was by way of New England as a defensive assistant under Bill Belichick. Tua had come out and said some words earlier this week about how Flores, his former coach, was a quote-unquote terrible person. How he was just being, maybe not ridiculed, but maybe undressed whether it was in the quarterback room or maybe in front of his other teammates saying that he wasn't good enough. And, of course, I'm paraphrasing here. A guy that certainly wasn't encouraging to his quarterback, especially coming in as a rookie, more discouraging, if anything. And then Flores had to come out. And I guess for Flores, give it up. At least he was very candid in his response. Didn't try to poo-poo it. Didn't try to sweep it under the rug, saying that, yes, maybe I should have handled it a little bit differently. I know that it was unfair, and again, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but it was interesting for Tua to come out with his comments to, ooh, throw Flores under the bus, but then Flores came back and said, you know what? My error, my mistake, I should have handled it a lot differently, and kudos to him. Now, I don't know if that was a ploy to maybe have Flores, and especially with all the baggage that he had trying to sue the NFL for hiring practices, as we know, a couple of years ago when it looked like he was going to get the giant job, but the other Brian got it, Dable, and not he, Flores. Therefore, that's when he tried to uncover whatever controversy, discussions that were made between he and the Giants, thinking that he had the job in the bag and thinking that lawsuits were going to be, at the end of the day, the cure-all for whatever hiring practices that some of these organizations have when it comes to the Rooney Rule and things of that nature. But as we know, that got shot down. And now that Flores is an assistant on the Vikings... It's a scenario that maybe with all this talk recently about how bad he was, and his first year was actually pretty good as a coach of the Miami Dolphins, but the last couple, uh -uh, not so good, and including trading Minka Fitzpatrick in the middle of that. Now, I don't know if that's all squarely on the coach. Maybe that was Chris Greer, the GM, and we all know that Greer and Flores had their own issues, and I said I was going to talk about this for two minutes, but now I had to unpack this to further explain so you get a better gist of why I'm explaining this. And this is why I love to do what I love to do, people, because it'd be unfair to you to be like, I don't know who Brian Flores is. I don't know what beef he had with the Dolphins, with this coach, with that player, with that. So this is why I'm unpacking it. But the story to me is more Flores coming out and being honest as opposed to Tua and what he said, because we could get that he said, she said from so many different angles. But I come correct to say that Flores... Maybe with his admission of mishandling the situation between he and Tua, maybe this is a scenario where he's looking to get back 
into a situation where he could get a head coaching job somewhere down the road. That's my way of thinking, and that's my logic as to why Flores came out. And maybe by his admittance, he's doing the right thing and just trying to be a very, not only candid, as I mentioned, but just a stand-up guy. That what happened there a few years ago in Miami, that wasn't me. He was maybe just trying to be someone that he wasn't. And learning under Bill Belichick, he was maybe too stoic or maybe just too stern. Who knows? But now to come out and admit all of his shortcomings there, especially in the way he dealt with his quarterback. Now he's trying to make amends through the media, not only with Tua, but maybe even with the other 31 teams in the NFL if by any chance he's looking for a head coaching job. All right, now let me stay with football as I keep the helmet and shoulder pads on, but I'm going to discuss college football. And I'm not going to have a preview until I get to next week. I will say that the AP poll of the top three, I'm not going to go to the top 10 and break that down, but the powers that be feel, the Associated Press, that it's Georgia, Ohio State, and Oregon are your top three teams in the nation. And next week we'll unpack Everything including what the season is going to possibly look like, with, look like under the new playoff format, 12 teams, etc. Which to me, not to say it's going to put a damper, but it's certainly not going to be as thrilling as we've seen here over the last few years. Where we have to figure out or maybe even speculate which team could make the Final Four or which team could be out. And last year was a perfect indication of that. Because we saw Alabama beat Georgia in the SEC championship game. And then Florida, even though without their quarterback, Jordan Travis, who got hurt there late in the year. But they had a perfect record. And a lot of people thought Florida State deserved to go. But if Alabama won and beat Georgia, they deserved to get that spot. And as we saw at the end of the day, yes, Alabama did get in. Georgia was out. Same for Florida State. And therefore, it was a scenario where a lot of people there, especially in Tallahassee, were up in arms as to why they didn't make it. Well, you're not going to have that type of breakdown this year, and especially if it's a team that, let's say, is ranked 12th, but a team outside of that, let's say, is maybe 13th, who plays in a powerful conference, and I'm just throwing a team out there. Let's say it's Liberty, and maybe they had a good season. Maybe they lost two games, and that's the other thing, too, about this college football season, which I'll get more to next week, but anyway, I'll unpack that a week from today, but the season does begin on Saturday, where Florida State will play Georgia Tech in Dublin, Ireland. I thought maybe Notre Dame would be a little bit more fitting, but who am I to say? But I don't know how many people are going to be wrapped up in watching Florida State. I understand that they're a top-ranked team. I get it that they are the Seminoles, etc. Let's see what they can do to piggyback off of last year, despite the fact them not showing up against Georgia in that bowl game. But for those who are just salivating, for those who are just chomping at the bit, foaming at the mouth, for any type of football, including college, well... Saturday, the curtain will raise, although very slowly, because I'm sure it's going to go over a lot of people's heads, thinking that the season in earnest will begin next Saturday. I know you have games on Thursday night, ESPN, etc., but no, we know that next Saturday, the final day of the month, that's the college football season and when it begins. And then you have a scenario with Kirk Ferentz, the Iowa coach, the longtime Iowa coach, I believe he's the longest active coach in the nation to play or to coach for one team. Well, he and an assistant will get a one-game suspension for violating recruitment protocol on the quarterback, Cade McNamara. Now, this story came through yesterday, and I don't know all the particulars about it, whether or not he should have got more than one game, maybe he should have got three, who knows. Who? I don't even know if anything else is going to come out of this as far as maybe some other juicy storylines similar to what we saw last year there with Jim Harbaugh, now two separate issues, I get it, with the recruitment in 2020 and then the sign-stealing scandal that happened where he missed the first three games and then got three more games in the middle of the season. But who knows if anything else is going to come out of this along the lines of maybe some more dirt where he probably should have and could have gotten more games, but as it is, he gets one game, no big whoop, but Ferenc will not patrol the sidelines there when Iowa kicks off their season next week. Then, a couple of other things before I bid adieu. I'll start with the NBA. Some sad news there. Al Adels. This is a guy that's an institution there in the Bay Area. Now, he was drafted by the Philadelphia Warriors going back to 1960. So that just goes to show you how much 
blood that he has in this organization going as far back as then, then played when the team moved to San Francisco, became the Golden State Warriors, and then not only was a player there, but also was a coach, won a championship in 1975 led by Rick Barry, was also a GM of the team. The guy had pretty much worn all the hats there that you could possibly imagine and was an ambassador for the team well past his playing, coaching, and his executive years. Al Adels died yesterday at the age of 87. Don't know what the cause of his death was, but considering that I'm sure everybody in the Bay Area, an outpouring of love, an outpouring of support for their, think about it, their prodigal son. Because for a guy that has been a part of that organization going back 60 some odd years, and for Adels, is a Hall of Famer. Now, didn't put up Hall of Fame numbers. We all know the NBA, or I should say the Basketball Hall of Fame, it's a just Naismith Hall of Fame. So it's not only just for your playing days, and we get it for executive and all that, but for his tenure there as a member of the Warrior organization, just that alone made him a member of the Hall of Fame. Thoughts, prayers, condolences go out to the Adels family, the Warrior organization, the NBA overall for a guy that literally, when you think of the Golden State Warriors, I get it. He's not Rick Barry. He's not Steph Curry. He's not Chris Mullen. He's not, dare I even say, Chris Webber. Well, Webber only had a couple of years there before he got traded to Washington. And, of course, got traded to Golden State by way of Orlando. But as far as Mount Rushmore, when it comes to Golden State, you have to put Adels up there. No ifs, ands, buts, maybes about, about it. So, sad news there in the NBA. Quickly with the NHL, I know there was a trade the other day where Patrick Lane, the Columbus Blue Jacket player, wanted out of Columbus and got traded to Montreal for Jordan Harris, a defenseman. Now, he asked for a trade. He got it. Now, I don't know if Lane wanted to go to Montreal. Was he that sick of Columbus where he just wanted out altogether? Now, he went from, I don't want to say hockey purgatory. I won't go that far, but Columbus certainly hasn't been a hotbed or hasn't had their moment in the sun, maybe their biggest moment in the sun off the top of my head was a sweep of the Tampa Bay Lightning. If you remember in 2019 where the Lightning had the record for the best, most points in the sport in the regular season and also most wins before the Bruins shattered that and we saw what happened with the Bruins two years ago. Well, Columbus swept them out of the postseason after the record-setting performance at the time of what the Lightning did. That is pretty much the Blue Jacket claim to fame. And for Lane to want to get out of there, maybe he said, I had enough. All right, he goes to the hockey-rich, tradition-rich Montreal Le Habitant Canadiens, but it's not as if they've done a lot here over the last 30-plus years. Yes, they did make it to a cup final in the pandemic year before losing to the Tampa Bay Lightning, but for... The player, who I don't know if he's able to dictate, try to pull an NBA player empowerment move on the organization. All right, he gets uprooted, he goes there. I'm sure he's probably excited to get out of Ohio, but I don't know how much Montreal is going to be a part of the Eastern Conference or even the Atlantic Division as far as making a hay and maybe getting into the postseason. So for Lane, he got what he wished for, but was Montreal the destination? I don't know. All right, and then finally, some tennis as I take off my skates and break out the tennis racket. Interesting storyline happened over the last couple of days with one of the top tennis players in the sport, and that's the number one ranked player in the world. I believe he should have been knocked to maybe number two or three at this point, considering that Carlos Alcaraz, after winning in Wimbledon and overtaking, I would think at the time, should have overtaken Sinner in the process. But for Sinner, who came down the other day with a positive steroid test, and let me see if I got the steroid here. I don't have it. It was one that was used during recovery when he visited his masseuse, and it was unbeknownst to him, even unbeknownst to his masseuse, that he was using a particular, I guess, cream or some sort of stimulant to relieve the body of a one Yannick Sinner, and because he was not only tested once, was tested twice, 
And for the USTA, whomever runs that, to just look at that and say, all right, under their investigation, figuring that it was just a terrible stroke of luck, how this particular substance was used on center and therefore tested positive. So this wasn't anything that was taken by him, whether it was a supplement or something that obviously could be taken through the mouth or even injection, dare I say. So considering that this was happening as a part of a recovery tool, I guess the USDA thought of it as, all right, well, we'll let that slide. But now I would think whenever that stimulant was used, it's going to have to be on the ban list. So for Sinner and for maybe other tennis players on the circuit, that's one they're going to have to avoid if they're trying to get themselves back on the beam, whether it's from one day to the next or from one match to the next or maybe even just along the lines of recovery between tournaments. For Sinner to avoid that, was certainly a missile because he probably would have not have been eligible for the U.S. Open, which will raise their curtain pretty much, not necessarily a stone's throw, but over the bridge from where I'm at in Flushing Meadow. And I'll talk more about that on Monday as we get closer to the start of the final Grand Slam of 2024. But one note, just to keep in the back of your memory bank, Carlos Alcaraz, his draw has both Sinner and, of course, the potential making it to a final to play Alcaraz. So he is on Sinner's side where Sinner is ranked number one, excuse me, Alcaraz three. You have Djokovic on the other side of the draw, so you're going to have one versus two if it does happen to work that way, where you have Sinner and Alcaraz in a final. But if somehow, some way. Sinner gets upset along the way, and who knows, coming to New York with the U.S. media, is that going to be a factor for Sinner where they're going to probably pound them with questions prior to the tournament or even in the opening rounds of this tournament? And I don't know how relentless the tennis media here in the States could be, but could that be a factor where it could maybe be bothersome or be an added layer to Sinner as he tries to perform and get himself ramped up and ready for a long couple of weeks over at Flushing? That we'll have to wait and see, but keep that in your mind as well. But for Sinner, he's going to have to face Alcaraz and vice versa in order to get to Djokovic if the chips fall in that fashion. So something to keep in mind as you're just days away from the U.S. Open out there. Billie Jean King, Louis Armstrong, Arthur Ashe Stadium. Looking forward to it as we begin to start to not only get to close out on the tennis season with all the majors in the books, but also the unofficial ending of summer. And I know that inside, and for anybody out there listening, I'm sure you're probably shedding a tear as I said that. That'll do it, my good people. You think I'm going to talk about Floyd Mayweather fighting Gotti this weekend? Absolutely not. That'll do it for another podcast. As always, thank you so much for stopping by, carving out precious time out of your day to listen to what it is I have to say about what goes on in the wonderful world of sports. If you haven't done so, like I mentioned each and every time, please subscribe, rate, review, Apple, Spotify, jreels.com, the channel on YouTube, at jreels. It'll go a long way to increasing the visibility of the podcast. You know the deal, I have to tell you. So if you could do that, I would sincerely and gratefully appreciate it. Also, YouTube, the vlog that I just mentioned, my Sojourn to Florida, part two. I also have part one, Orlando Kissimmee. Definitely check that. It's also on the YouTube channel. I haven't been able to plug that everywhere, but I'm doing it pretty much first and foremost right here before I even hit my socials. So go check that out one more time. Subscribe, like, leave a comment, do that one more time. I would just be grateful for your participation in that regard. And then if you want to hit me up with a question, comment, suggestion, you could do so at the following Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, the J Reels Podcast, Twitter, X, J Reels One, just a number. The old fashioned way, the J Reels Podcast at gmail.com. I'll be more than happy to follow up with you guys and gals. Because whether you do or do not know, this is what I love to do, people, full time, 24 7. This is what I've been built, ready, willing, and able to do. Hopefully, one day, with your help, people, with your participation, subscribing, rating, reviewing, going to drinkolipop.com. And I may have another brand partnership coming up. Not ready to announce that just yet, but that could be in the pike. Knock on wood there. So please, 
people, you know, I love to do this, born to do this, built to do this, with fire, passion, energy, fury, with my thoughts, opinions, critiques, praise, analysis, feelings, on anything and everything. That happens on the world of the diamond, ice, gridiron, hardwood, golf course, racetrack, tennis court, boxing ring, octagon, you name it. From my lips to your ears, from my heart to your soul, from where I am to wherever you are, the J Reels Podcast always comes correct, direct, and in full effect. From the South Bronx to South Beach to South Central to South Pacific and all points beyond, peace, love, and God bless everybody. And until next time on the J Reels Podcast, on the flip, baby.